Hit record, and here we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show here on YouTube. And my my little, uh, uh, well, uh, something that I started back this summer called Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture, which is a, a proper way to, to call my little interview series that I've been doing for over almost, well, over a year at least, you know, on YouTube. And today I got a guy who uh, worked with one of my favorite singers of all time, uh, Del Shannon. Uh, his name is uh, Max Crook, and he co-wrote the song, the hit song "Runaway." I got to work with uh, Del Shannon, and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate uh, you uh, let me take the time to uh, to talk to you for a few minutes. I know you're uh, you got some you're pretty busy today, so we'll we'll kind of keep this as brief as we can. <laughs> okay. So, uh, first question is, uh, what have you been up to lately there, Max? Well, <clears throat> basically we've been trying to uh, work in my little studio here and uh, get out some CDs. And these CDs are mainly uh, for uh, Christian music and for uh, congregational worship and uh, for uh, evangelism and that sort of thing. And so we've been very busy uh, laying out tracks and uh, bringing in various people who can do various parts. So that's been keeping us quite busy. We also, my wife and I, do the um, uh, praise and worship at the church, so that also takes time. And uh, other than that, I've been retired pretty much from the fire service where I originally worked in Ventura County, California. And um, so this keeps us busy here. Oh, that's cool. That, that's cool to know. Uh I had no idea that you were part of the fire department. Uh, that's kind of, uh, I guess, one of those hidden gems when uh, when you think that's you, you've known somebody just uh, based on the music that they wrote and performed. Yeah, um, it's uh, a lot of people don't know too much about that, but uh, I served in the fire service there in the uh, county fire department. I retired as a captain in the training bureau. Yeah. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty interesting. Uh, um, and and, and you're mostly your your claim to fame as far as the the music business is that uh, you got to meet and work with a, a very talented musician who got taken away from us. You know, even though he may have been uh, you know older at the time, but in 1990, I believe it was 1990, if I'm if I'm correct, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Charles Whedon Westover, aka for those of you who would know, Del Shannon. How did you guys' relationship kind of start? Um, we were, I was going to, to the University of uh, Western Michigan in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he was working in nightclubs in Battle Creek, and those towns are not very far apart. And uh, his drummer uh, heard me uh, when I was band in, uh, um, I was in a, a group called the White Bucks, which of course is now uh, politically incorrect. But however, um, so uh, but anyway, it's a rock group, and uh, he heard me play there, and he said, "Dell would like a keyboard player. Would you like to come over to the Hilo Club in Battle Creek and uh, meet him, and uh, maybe even uh, uh, do a, uh, a couple of numbers with him or something, just to see what he thinks." And so this this fellow I'm talking about is uh, Dick Parker, and a uh, drummer for um, the group. And uh, he uh, brought me over there, and one night I, I met uh, Dell, as he's now known. Yep. And he loved my music, and um, one thing he he was really interested in was I had this little keyboard that I had worked on and worked over and and um, invented some parts and rearranged some things on this. And this keyboard could sound like uh, many different instruments. And um, this is, went on to be the, the kind of famous Musitron device uh, that I worked on and built. And um, when I brought that in and played it, uh, he just about flipped out. Uh, so I've been working worked with him for uh, quite a while after that. Was he a pretty uh, pretty cool guy to work with? Uh, yeah, really was. Um, he, uh, he was very particular 
but um, he he knew when when what if you hit the right note he knew it. <laughs> he said that's it. Um, so he knew exactly what he wanted, and um, he uh, would play his guitar with it and see how it fit. By the way, Dell was a very very uh, excellent guitar player. Oh yeah. And and uh, he uh, this was he played guitar as he sang lead in his group over there, but many people don't know that uh, he played jazz, he played country, and um, all these things, and we uh, incorporated those things in the, in the in the sets that we played at night over there in the high low club. Huh. Oh, that's that's pretty interesting. Uh uh, yeah, I, I've heard a lot of the, the stuff that Dell has done. And, you know, the funny thing about it is that people still think that Dell Shannon is just a one-hit wonder. You know, they don't realize that, you know, there's uh, thou- well, I don't know if thousands, but, but hundreds upon hundreds of songs that he's uh, performed. A lot of cover songs, but a lot of original songs, too. And uh, I wonder why people just think that he's just a one-hit wonder. Um, I don't really know that. Um, maybe... Well, there was a time, a period of time, after he did the first album, which had Hats Off to Larry, his second uh, hit, and some others on there that um, uh, he actually wanted to do more country stuff. He's a great country singer, and uh, his managers said, uh, you don't do that. Um, People know you as a rock and roll star. We don't want to introduce anything that would... Take your take your minds off of that, um, but anyway, so he uh, backed off a little bit after that. That doesn't mean he wasn't writing hits. Yeah. he did hits that other people did and everything else. Uh, so, um, but as actually uh, a number one record that stayed on the charts for I don't know up to twenty eight weeks, something like that, whatever. Um, uh, he didn't have a second one of those, but he had he had many. Uh, number twos and, and chart hitters anyway. Huh. Well, that's that's pretty exciting. And, and I, I, I'm familiar with a lot of the, the stuff that Dell has done because even on a, a Facebook app called Spotify, you can listen to just about every type of music that you kind of want. And, and Dell Shannon, if you click on his name and stuff, he has a whole lot of probably just about every album that he's released, including like his uh, that album, uh, Hank, or uh, Dell Shannon sings Hank William Jr. tunes. Mm hmm. Sure, and I and I enjoyed that, and and uh, I think uh, t- to me, Del Chan is one of those guys who are totally underrated because I think he I think he deserves more props than he gets. You know, when they talk about people who have influenced rock and roll, and I love Buddy Holly and stuff. Buddy Holly is also one of my favorite uh, musicians, but I think Del Shannon should be mentioned in like people that have uh, been the uh, Cape Crusaders of uh, the origins of rock and roll. He did. Uh, this is very true. Um, he was innovative, and um, he was always looking for the hook, so-called the hook in the song. And uh, when we did Runaway, of course, the Runaway is full of hooks. Yeah. The whole thing's the hook. And um, uh, generally, what that what that means to to folks who are not real familiar with that term, it is a portion of the music which gets in your mind. And you can't get it out of there. And it's what causes you to go to the store and buy a record. <laughs> and um, so uh, normally that occurs in the chorus of a song, in uh, the construction of a song, um, in kind of technical terms. However, this song, The Runaway, and even some of his later ones, uh, they had these refrains, these hooks, these sounds, um, uh, different rhythms, uh, his falsetto, everything uh, was a hook, so to speak, and they appeared throughout his songs. But Runaway, um, uh, it grabbed the attention of people immediately. Uh, and there was an interesting thing I might mention a little further on in your uh, interview here, if you would like to hear it, that, that happened in the studio. Um, but um, that they, it was immediately recognized. Uh, interestingly, also, when we first took that uh, from the high Club, where we recorded it on my little uh, reel-to-reel tape recorder, as a demo, we took it into these people in Detroit, and um, they were, uh, eventually they turned out to be uh, the big top record execs there. Um, we took that in, and uh, they said, you know, 
the song is so different that I don't know whether we should touch it. I, I, I think it's beyond people's grasp right now. There's just It's too different. And so uh, the fellow that took it in, who was the disc jockey friend of mine uh, uh, in, in the Ann Arbor area, close to Detroit, he said, okay, if you don't want to do it, I'll take it to somebody else. And he said, well, they like that little musitron thing going on. And they said, you know, um, let's sign into a contract and we'll do maybe four tunes. And uh, so they, they finally ended up recording it, which I might mention how that went a little later. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, what was uh, your reaction when you found out that he uh, committed suicide? Uh, grief. It was a. Uh, you, you feel a loss in the pit of your stomach, and um, I didn't see this coming myself. Um, but when I found out later on uh, that he had been uh, being treated by a so-called doctor. Uh, with uh, very dangerous, and if, particularly if they're unsupervised, drugs for depression. Um, it made, uh, uh, well, it made me mad, first of all, that somebody didn't monitor that a little bit better, but a lot of people have had trouble with these particular drugs that he was on. I'm not going to mention them because they're, yeah, they're, okay. they're uh, well-known drugs, but people, if they're on a, a depression uh, relief program, uh, demand that your doctor watch your every move. Oh, sure. And, and uh, the last question I have for you before I let you go is, uh, what do you think Dell's legacy will be? Um, as an innovator, um, as somebody who was, uh, who could take virtually anybody's song and uh, make it very interesting. Um, he was a uh, uh, type of who would... Uh, uh, he would look for a sound, go after a particular uh, um, type of tune, and then he would work it in, uh, normally very quickly. Um, there are many other uh, interesting things that he did. Uh, uh, and one last thing about Runaway before we go here sure. uh, that I might tell you. When we were in the studio, uh, the studio was... Um, um, Sound Factory out of New York. We had um, uh, we had several people there who were in the engineer's booth, and these people would their job was to take a song being recorded and worked on and beep it out over the wires via a fairly good high fidelity system uh, to various distributors across the country and get the reaction. And if the reaction was positive. Uh, or they thought they had some some uh, possibilities. They would continue to work on the record and perfect it the best they could there at the studio. They did this to run away, and, and while it was still in a rough form, not even finished, they had orders for over fifty thousand copies. Oh, jeez! Oh, well, that's pretty cool. And, and uh, it's it's good to hear the the, the story of uh, even if it's just a brief story of, of Dell's life in your words because you you uh, pretty much got to be. His uh, best, I don't know if you guys were best friends at all, but I, I think you guys were more or less like brothers, more or less. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, uh, it's sad to know that uh, he's been gone for, his, for what, over 23 years now. But his legacy and his music will always uh, live forever. And I just want to say uh, thank you, Max, for uh, letting me talk to you for a few minutes. And I hope everybody enjoys mm -hmm. this interview. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, sharing it with me. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and God bless your fans. Exactly. God bless you too, man. We'll talk to you later. Bye bye. You bet. <laughs> and that was Max Crook, uh, who just uh, we just talked to here for a little bit about the life and legacy of Dale Shannon. Now that's you know this is a story that I could I could talk about for a long long time because Dale Shannon just like with you know uh, Big Bopper and Buddy Holly and. And uh, Doc, uh, let's see Doc Watson, and, and some of the, the and Sam Kinison, and uh, whoever else that we've uh, done uh, legacy interviews on, and, and the shout on on everything of people who are either still around or, or not around no more. Uh, it's just uh, great to to learn stories from the people that uh, were with 
these people or who knew these people or who may even not know these people but knew a lot about them to share their story. And Del Shannon is one of those. If Max had some more time, I would have loved to. We could have chatted for over an hour. I, I would let it go probably an hour and a half if <laughs> if he would have allowed it. Uh, because Del Shannon's story is definitely worth telling. And I like I said, I don't think he gets enough recognition for the things that he's done in uh, rock and roll music and stuff because he's not just a one-hit wonder. Uh, people who think that he is, well, he's not. He, he's uh, You go go on Spotify or you go to Amazon.com or you go somewhere where you can uh, go to Wikipedia and learn about his biography and you'll uh, go to his disc discography and uh, you'll see all the albums that he's done and cover songs and everything. He's just one of those guys that I can't get sick of listening to. I can listen to his stuff over and over again and always learn something new about the man, the myth, the, leg, the legend, uh, Charles Whedon Westover, uh, a.k.a. Dale Shannon. So, hope you guys enjoyed this little quick little interview, and uh, we'll see you again for another great Frankie Slauson show. Bye-bye. <laughs>